there are these cocktail parties in Beirut that, that I think only had spies in them, looked spying on each other, all of whom were aiming at trying to entrap Philby. The Brits sent one of his best friends from MI6 to Beirut in 60. And this man confronted Philby, said, you're a spy. And Philby said, ah, you've got me. I'll come by in the morning and, and confess. The next morning, they found out that Philby had left, that the Soviets had sent a, a freighter to the harbor in Beirut. Philby had gotten on that, and he went to Moscow. Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, where we look at the forgotten, neglected, strange, and even counterfactual stories that made our world what it is. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Today's episode is a close look at Kim Philby. He's a master spy and notorious double agent who was the mentor and later mortal enemy of James Angleton, who would later eventually lead the CIA. And Kim Philby, at one point, was closely in the running to lead Britain's MI6. It was also a Soviet mole, so that would have been a very interesting alternate history if it would have come true. Philby was one of the leaders of British counterintelligence efforts, first against the Nazis, then against the Soviet Union. He was also the KGB's most valuable double agent. He was so highly regarded that his image is on the postage stamps of the Russian Federation today. The Russian Federation opened up its archives, and we're continuing still to learn about all the things that the Soviet Union did during the Cold War, and as we can see from this example, they did a lot. To delve into Philby's life is today's guest, Michael Holtzman, author of the new book, Spies and Traitors, Kim Philby, James Angleton, and the friendship and betrayal that would shape MI6, the CIA, and the Cold War. Before he was exposed, Philby was the mentor of Angleton, one of the central figures in the early years of the CIA, who became the long-serving chief of the counterintelligence staff of the agency. Angleton and Philby were friends for six years, or so Angleton thought. Then they were enemies for the rest of their lives. And Angleton learned that Philby was directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of agents through the intelligence he leaked to the KGB. So in this discussion, we're going to get to the heart of one of the most important and flawed personal relationships in modern history that had huge ripple effects that affected the entire Cold War. So I hope you enjoy this discussion with Michael Holzman. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, different spies have appeared on this podcast before. Listeners have heard me talk about Richard Sorge, who was a German national in Japan who fed intelligence back to the Soviet Union and made them aware that... Imperial Japan was not going to attack their western flank. We've talked about George Koval, another Soviet spy from Iowa who fed atomic secrets back to the Soviet Union. Spy masters like Queen Elizabeth's Francis Walsingham, who got wind of the invasion of the Spanish Armada. Going back even further, the Roman spy network, the Frumentari, who were wheat traders who, due to their Extensive travels and contacts all over the empire were able to feed intelligence back to the imperial center. But we're going to talk about another figure here, Kim Philby, who you make the argument affected much of the trajectory of the Cold War. And something I've been interested in seeing when digging into the biographies of different spies is they come from different backgrounds. They have surprisingly different temperaments. They're not all James Bonds. They're not all... Dusko Popov or this type of flamboyant character. So before getting into the particulars, can you tell me about Kim Philby and what made him a good spy? Kim Philby, that's actually not his name. His name is uh, Harold Philby, but he was born in India, and therefore he was nicknamed Kim after the Kipling novel, uh, Hero. He followed his father to Westminster and Trinity College, Cambridge where he was a good but not a brilliant student. He spent most of his time in those years with his friends Donald McLean and Guy Burgess and others on the steadily more leftward depression era, British left. He traveled around Europe, often on motorcycle. After graduation, he went back to Europe, to Vienna, where he met a young woman and the revolution. He took the young woman, Litzy Friedman, and so to speak, the revolution back to London, where Litzy Friedman, now Litzy Philby, opened a figurative door through which Kim Philby stepped to find a man on a park bench named Deutsch, who invited him to work for peace, to be a common turn agent, that is, a spy for the Soviet Union. The party told him to keep his affiliation secret, to make himself useful in a way that would disguise it. His father pulled some strings, 
This seems to be a theme. The Times hired him as a stringer and sent him to Spain to report on the Civil War from the fascist side. Soon half the coverage of the war and that influential newspaper was written by Kim Tooley. When Franco won, hundreds of thousands of refugees walking over the mountains to French concentration camps, Kim Philby returned to London and was sent by the Times to accompany the British Expeditionary Force of France and after Dunkirk back. By this time, he had separated from Lizzie Friedman. It wouldn't do for a fascist newspaper men to be married to a Jewish communist. People might become suspicious. Coincidentally, perhaps, Kim Philby's school friend, Guy Burgess, was by then associated with a branch of the British Intelligence Service. Burgess, also working for peace, as it were, pulled him aboard. This was easy enough, as the leaders of British intelligence knew his people and could see that he had a medal that had been pinned to his chest by Franco himself. Philby's father had been a secret agent for British intelligence. During the first world, just before the First World War in India, during the First World War in the Middle East, he had become acquainted with Ibn Saud, who was in the process of consolidating his control of Saudi Arabia. In a way, Philby's father, whose name was Sinjin Philby, was parallel to T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia was backing the Hussein family. And so in the movie, you get Faisal Hussein and so forth to become paramount ruler in the Middle East, while Sinjin Philby was uh, backing Ibn Saud. So in a way, Kim Philby inherited the vocation to be in secret intelligence. So could you tell me about his work with the OSS, how he gets involved in the British counterintelligence efforts against the Nazis? Sure. British Secret Intelligence Service had been quite small before the Second World War. But as the war got started, they kind of cranked things up. Philby became a member of MI6, which was the British Secret Intelligence Service that covered the uh, world outside the British Empire. And he rose rather quickly in counterintelligence. Counterintelligence is the branch of intelligence works that tries to keep other intelligence organizations from finding out your own secrets. After a couple of years of this, when he was really the shining light in this area, he was a very charming man. The Americans came in. The Americans had had no intelligence service at all. Once the war started, uh, a man named Donovan went to Roosevelt and he said, you actually should have a secret intelligence service. And they set up the Office of Special Services, OSS. OSS uh, hired lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, among other people, they hired James Angleton, who was a very young man at that point. He had graduated from Yale. He was unhappily studying the law at Harvard. His father was already in OSS. His father is very interesting. We can talk about that if you wish. Angleton goes to London, and he becomes a student of Philby's in a quite formal way. They said, young American man. Here's our counterintelligence expert, uh, learn from him. So they had adjoining offices on Ryder Street in uh, central London. And Angleton spent about a year there learning the ropes, how you find out if somebody's spying on you, what you do about that. Philby was in charge, uh, first of uh, counterintelligence for the British for Spain and Portugal and then for the entire Mediterranean world. Angleton was sent to Italy after the Anglo-American invasion of Italy to set up counterintelligence operations there. And he grew up very fast. He was, first was interrogating people who had come across the lines, line crossers. And then pretty, much, pretty soon he was in charge of all counterintelligence for OSS for Italy, hunting fascists, Italian fascists hunting German Nazis, and setting up what became his specialty, which was coordination with other intelligence services. One of those that became significant was that the intelligence service for what was to become the Israeli uh, Mossad was being set up in Italy at that time, and Angleton kind of nurtured it. 
all this time he was uh, referring to King Philby. I've got a problem with this. What do I do about that? Do you know anything about this? Philby had uh, reached pretty much the, the peak of his renown after having rolled up the entire German intelligence service in Spain. Well, he could do pretty much what he wanted to. What the British intelligence service didn't know, and of course what the American intelligence service didn't know, was that Philby was reporting everything that he came across to the KGB. So he would send them lists of all the agents working for MI6. He would send them lists of all the agents working for OSS. He said, you're not being told this. Here's what the inside scoop is, and so forth. The KGP was grateful. It's interesting now to see archives open up after all of these decades. We're able to like finally see behind the curtain and see what's happening behind the scenes in World War II, things that uh, weren't made clear to us uh, for several decades. From what you've been able to ascertain from your research, what sort of counter-espionage was Philby involved in during World War II? What were some events or missions that really stuck out? And how did his feeding intelligence to the KGB, what did that result in? Were agents tracked much more closely? Or, yeah, what was the result of that? On the first part of that, Philly was important in developing a organizational unit that took the intercepted German messages from Bletchley, you've heard of this, the, the coded uh, Enigma code, and provided them to officers in the field so that they could then be used. And what he and Angleton worked together on was that Philby would send Angleton information that there, there was, the Germans were about to do this. And he had gotten this from this extremely secret source. So then Angleton would take that information and he said, I've just captured some German documents that say the Germans are about to do this concealing the source, and then getting validation for what a great guy he was. What Philby did with the KGB during the Second World War was probably just kind of confirming things for them. The KGB, of course, was spending most of its time in the first year, years of the war trying to survive and trying to keep the Red Army fighting. As time went on, and it became clear that there was going to be a conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States and Great Britain, the information that he provided became more and more important. In the immediate post-war period, there were two major projects that showed his hand. Almost immediately after the end of the war, the United States, the CIA, the predecessor of the CIA, decided it wanted to topple the communist regime in Albania. So they trained a lot of Albanians and put them on boats and parachuted them from airplanes into Albania to overthrow the communist government. They all died. And uh, this didn't stop the CIA. They kept sending more and more. Uh, and they all died. So finally they, they stopped. And it turned out many years later, as you say, when the documents became clear, that Philby was sending all the information about these operations to uh, the Soviet Union, which sent them to Albania, which then was able to intercept the operations. This was hundreds of people. The second project, which was perhaps even larger, was a similar effort to overthrow the communist regime in Poland. The American intelligence service and the British intelligence service were got word that there was a Polish resistance organization. And these people were being led by brave former Polish army officers, and they were fighting the occupying Red Army. And all they needed was money and arms. So the British and Americans would parachute money and guns into the forest in Poland. And uh, they would get a message back saying, that's great, how about some more? But nothing ever happened. And when they parachuted in agents, those agents never reported. So it turned out that this, this effort, which I, I think went for a year or two, had all been given to them by Philby. And all these people had done. So those were two of the things that, that he did there. 
that's really interesting to imagine that perhaps different communist regimes could have been toppled if uh, different resistance groups would have had support, especially in the early years after they were set up when these new Soviet republics weren't very well entrenched. It's very interesting to imagine the counterfactual. So here's something I'm very curious about with Philby. Why was he so successful in not raising suspicion and being able to pass on this intelligence for a long period of time? I mentioned Richard Sorge earlier, the German national in Japan who was so charismatic and he was a playboy who was friends with the German diplomatic corps. And I guess they had such a good time with him and the friendship was so strong that they overlooked some of his other activities. With George Koval, the atomic spy working on the Manhattan Project, he was a very low-key person and just managed to go under the radar that way. And so he just simply didn't arouse suspicion. What was it about Philby, do you think, that made him so successful and being able to pass along this intelligence for such a long period of time without raising suspicion? It's more like Sorge. He was very charming. He was always in a good mood. Uh, he was very helpful to people. I think it was helpful to Angleton. And then there was a specific British thing. It was when he was first hired by the Secret Intelligence Service, the person who did it said, oh, well, we knew his people. So they had this completely closed circuit class that they drew from. Uh, Philby went to Westminster College, which was a high school, <laughs> and then to Trinity College, in a time when, when maybe half of 1% of the British population went to university. So they all knew each other. And in this case, all the next generation of the older generation, they all knew his father. And his father was a legendary person. So there was a very strong class issue here. They weren't going to say, this man who's one of us is betraying us. Never came up. He was actually never suspected. When he was finally caught, it was just, I think he was a sociopath. I don't know how many sociopaths you've come across, but they tend to be extremely charming people. And the only problem with them is that they have no conscience whatsoever. And that's pretty much what he was like. Everybody loves Kim Philby. Which for that line of work made him very successful if he could play on other sympathies and then do so without any regard uh, for them personally. It would help to be a sociopath. Yes. So can you describe the working relationship and the friendship between Philby and Angleton that since this sets the stage for a lot what happens in your book after he's discovered? So could you describe their working relationship up to the point where Philby is discovered? Yeah, I think we want to make a little definition here. Spy is, the word spy is not a, a term of art. What you have are civil service employees, somebody who works for, like if you work for the CIA and you're a high-ranking person, you're a GS-15, so it's government service, rank 15. You have a pension and an office and so forth. And that was similar to what happened with the Brits. Then you have agents. An agent is somebody who's hired by the official, and they're not an employee of the government. They have no rights. I came across some documents where there were contracts that were given by Angleton to agents in Italy that included a, a phrase at the end, when you're killed in the line of duty here, your survivors will get this amount of money. Uh, please give their contact information. So that was the kind of uh, relationship you had what Lacare calls Joes, these people. Okay. Philby sat in an office. He was a government official. He sat in an office in a very posh part of London. And all anybody could see from the outside was that he was writing reports. So this wouldn't arouse suspicion. It wasn't anything he did that they saw. He would occasionally then, he went to bars a lot. He was also, also an alcoholic. All these people were alcoholics. He'd go to a, a pub and he'd kind of wink at somebody and they'd go for a walk and he'd give them a stack of papers. And that person would give the stack of papers to someone else and it would go to the Soviet embassy and it would go to Moscow. The, that paper trail is the only way he could have been caught and no one was watching him. So he wasn't caught. At the end of the war, Angleton stayed in Italy for a couple of years, and he helped fix the 1948 election so that the communists were kept out of the government. And that's an interesting story. After 
two or three years in Italy, he went to Washington. And that was just about the time when the CIA was being founded. He rose very rapidly through the CIA. In 49, Philby, who was maybe on track to becoming head of MI6, was sent to Washington also to be the liaison person between all the British intelligence services and all the American intelligence services, CIA, FBI, everything else. And there was a uh, party circuit there, right? Uh, there probably aren't parties in Washington anymore. But uh, at that time, there was a party circuit that was intelligence officials, foreign office people, newspaper people. And Philby and Angleton were part of this. And the wives were part of this. The Philbys, for some reason, and this has never been explained, let Guy Burgess, the fellow who had brought Philby into British intelligence, be a lodger in his house. So it was a, a set of uh, coincidences. There was uh, some decoded messages that pointed a finger at a third person, Donald McLean. The KGB decided that Donald McLean was too fragile to uh, stand up to interrogation, so they wanted to pull him back to Moscow. They told Guy Burgess to help him go. They took Guy Burgess along with him. When Guy Burgess and McLean disappeared, the finger was pointed at Philby. Philby was brought back to London by MI6, and everybody said, well, we can't prove you're a spy, but it sure looks like you're a spy, and why don't you get a job with a newspaper? So he was sent out, hung up to dry, and then he went, his friends at MI6 said, really, we can't do this to Kim, everybody loves Kim. We'll get him a really good job in Beirut to be the Middle East news correspondent. So he does this. All the time he's doing this, there are these problems at the CIA. First the Albanian thing, and then the Polish thing, and then many, many other problems that occurred. And whenever this happened, Angleton said, this is Kim's work. He's doing this. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Here's one thing I'm curious about, and you mentioned this as an aside, and that was uh, Angleton keeping the communists out of the government in 1948. So could you talk about that a bit more? Sure. The resistance to the Nazis in, in Italy was led by the Communist Party, Communist Party of Italy. At the end of the war, there was a very unstable situation with the Italian government. And the Communist Party of Italy controlled all the local governments in the north, Milan, uh, Turin, Bologna, and so forth. And there was coming up, there was going to be an election in 48 with a national, uh, national government. And it looked pretty much to the United States government, to the State Department, that the communists were going to win. And then we'd have a communist Italy. And they figured they'd like to talk about dominoes. So they thought if, if Italy went communist, then France would come, become communist, and pretty soon New Jersey would be communist. Yeah. So they said to the CIA, do something about this. And they gave, these are predecessors of the CIA, but in any case, they gave them lots and lots of money. And the agents and the officers, Angleton, took all this money and bribed a lot of people. And they also gave the money to the Christian Democratic Party, which was the organ of the Catholic Church in Europe at the time, to fight the election. They would do this with, not in a very subtle way, they would do this with bags of money in the trunk of, the fiat, of their fiats, and they would meet somebody on a, on a road and they would give them this money. And these people would either pay for radio announcements or posters or simply bribe people, hand out money. And they did it pretty effectively. And so the Christian Democratic Party and its allies just barely won the 1948 election which kept the communists out, and it turned out to be a turning point in Italian politics. Communists never came that close again, although the CIA continued to do this, so that Bill Colby, who was later to be head of the CIA, had the same assignment in the next general election four years later. And he talks in his autobiography about doing this. And I said that Angleton was a specialist in relations with other intelligence services. He had very early on, during the Second World War, become the controller of the Italian Naval Intelligence Service. And he maintained this situation uh, for at least 10 years, I think. 
and saw through being able to controlling the military intelligence service of the country, he was able to then infiltrate the government itself and maintain control and keep the communists out. Well, uh, going back to what Philby did, I mean, Philby, this is fascinating that he was possibly on track to lead MI6. So we could have had a Soviet mole leading MI6. Do you have, I mean, what would have happened with the Cold War if that would have been the case? I don't think it would have been much different. Really? Intelligence services fight each other, except for military intelligence. Now, if you're in a military intelligence organization and you're told, how many troops does the other side have? And you find out, then that's a good thing. If you don't find out, it's Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. You know, the German military intelligence system uh, service was off by a million at Stalingrad. Where are, where are all these people coming from? <laughs> but civilian intelligence is mo- mostly it's counterintelligence. They're trying to keep other people from finding out your, your secrets. There's an, another part, though, which is operations, which was originally different from the CIA and is di- different from MI6 and MI5. So in the Second World War, the British had a, an organization called SOE, a Special Operations Executive, that went around blowing up bridges and railroad tracks and things like that. That was not part of their intelligence establishment. The United States, at the, at the end of the OSS, had an organization like that. But after the war, hived off, and then only later did it come to the CIA. I'm not sure what Philby would have been able to do except tell the KGB what MI6 was doing, in, as he had been doing. So if MI6 had sent agents to uh, Budapest to do secret operations there, he could tell them that. As a matter of fact, he did. Well, I think things would be largely the same. I'm not sure how much this kind of intellectualized, if we could put it that way. Secret intelligence matters. The operational thing matters. Towards the end of the Cold War, through national technical means, as they say, the CIA was able to, or actually NSA, was able to eavesdrop on the the mobile phones of members of the Kremlin. So uh, they could, if one minister called up another minister and said, I think we should do this next week, they could tell. They knew that way. But that was 1980. That was after all this. Well, going back with Philby, and he's suspected in Washington of being a double agent, when is his cover completely blown? And what is the aftershock of that? So in 1959, his friends in MI6 said, We'll give you this nice job. We'll send you to Beirut. Goes to Beirut, and he he was actually a very good journalist. So all the news about the Middle East that would be in your morning newspaper if you were in London was from Philby, which was kind of interesting. One way that he was able to, to do this effectively was his father was still alive. His father was still there, and his father knew all the heads of state in the Middle East. And he'd call them up and he'd say, hey, my boy Kim's coming by. Could you see him? Uh, which no one else had that entree. Angleton was angry. He said, you know, this is my friend, this is my teacher, and it it sure looks to me like he's a Soviet spy. So he put people into Beirut, into Philby's social group, as did the Brits. So there were were these cocktail parties in Beirut that, that I think only had spies in them, looked spying on each other all of whom were aiming at trying to entrap Philby. The Brits sent one of his best friends from MI6 to Beirut in 60. And this man confronted Philby, said, you're a spy. And Philby said, ah, you've got me. I'll come by in the morning and and confess. So the guy says, right. And uh, the next morning they found out that Philby had left that the Soviets had sent a, a freighter to the harbor in Beirut. Philby had gotten on that, and he went to Moscow. So at that point, then from Angleton's point of view, what you get is, yes, he's a spy. He's in, <laughs> he's in Moscow. And what are we going to do about this? We have to go back and look at everything he knew and see how it had, how things had gone wrong and whether he had had a finger in that. 
And then we need to figure out what he's going to do in Moscow. Well, the first thing he did in Moscow was that he wrote down the names and a CIA agent he had ever encountered and with descriptions. So there are hundreds of these. And they had to, both the British service and the American service, had to find other jobs for them or put them on long vacations because they were useless. They were all blown, which revealed itself because people started getting killed. It wasn't that the KGB published a list. And, you know, whenever anything else happened, Angleton would say that this was Kim's work. We have to be careful about this. Also, the KGB's game got kind of upped because eventually, after they dried Philby out, which took some doing, they put him in charge of training new agents. So he would give lessons on how to pretend you're an Englishman and, and so forth. And that became a serious threat to the operations of MI6. Well, you know how these two become enemies, Angleton and Philby. So what does this next chapter look like where Philby is training agents that could very well target and assassinate other British agents or American agents. So what does this rivalry between the two look like at this stage? Well, it looks like he'll be leading a very quiet life in Moscow, going to the office every once in a while, training young agents and saying, oh, yes, and I remember this, and that gets used. And Angleton trying to figure out how to counter that. He becomes quite concerned about the general situation. He says, how do you know that some, somebody you've hired isn't an agent? My best friend, charming Kim Philby, was an agent of the Soviets. How do you know that it isn't? And he started putting in uh, more and more rigorous vetting for CIA officials who wanted to hire agents, which is a perfectly rational thing to do. But the agents were the officials were, in effect, paid by how many agents they had hired and how successful those were. So they saw Angleton as blocking them. This went on for quite some time. And eventually the CIA split effectively into two parts. The operators who said, we want to go out there and put our agents into Warsaw. And Angleton and his staff, he had a very big staff, he had 100 people or something who are saying, well, that's well and good, but how do you know that the guy you're sending into Warsaw is not a Polish secret intelligence service agent? And there were then a, a series of scandals about things. It was found out that from the early 1950s, Angleton had been in charge of an office that opened all international mail leaving the United States. So if you were sending a, a, a letter to Istanbul, it would be read by the CIA, and the reply would be read by the CIA. And if you were sending a telegram, same thing there. The telegraph company turned over all of its telegrams to the CIA. This was revealed, and it was a big problem. The Senate didn't like this at all. So the CIA said, we'll stop, and then they didn't put it in. Then there was a scandal about the National Students Association, where it turned out that the CIA had infiltrated the National Student Association, and it was prevented by law from working in the United States. And so people didn't like that either. That was kind of on the downside for Angleton. I'm sorry, for Angleton. When the Warren Commission was launched into the assassination of President Kennedy, the CIA was afraid that it would be blanked. So they assigned to Angleton to be the CIA representative to the Warren Commission. And he said, well, all these rumors that you're hearing are simply conspiracy theories, which was, he coined the term. And the CIA had nothing to do with it. It was probably the Cubans. Or it was Moscow. Maybe it was Kim. Well, something that you mentioned is that the rivalry between the two had dramatic effects on the Cold War. And you already mentioned a few. But in general, how would you describe how, I mean, really the all the espionage and counter-espionage and everything happening uh, in the Cold War was affected by Philby, Angleton, and their rivalry? I think it, it was uh, affected in, in the way I was describing. It was that Angleton's concern about the penetration 
by uh, the Soviets of the Anglo-American services slowed things down and perhaps prevented many operations that would otherwise have occurred. Now, there's an issue there, a judgment issue, about whether that was a good or a bad thing. Because given the record of CIA operations and its effect on the larger geopolitical situation, we don't know whether if they had been allowed to go forward, if more had been allowed to go forward, that would have been favorable to the United States. Think Bay of Pigs, for example. Eventually, after Angleton was retired, that stopped happening. And the operations people, the people who wanted to go out there and, and have big projects, had no one to constrain them. And if you look at the record of, of what was done, say, after 1970, and Vietnam, for example, was Bridges that era. We don't know whether that was a good thing. So I'd say it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's comforting or not to find out from the inside that intelligence being leaked at the highest level doesn't really affect things quite the way we think it does. But I'm always intrigued to learn about these personalities, and especially in the 20th century, where I think the Cold War arguably is the high watermark of international espionage, just based on the amount of resources and power that are in different embassies and their proximity to one another creates opportunities that they wouldn't have had. One last question, I mean, just to go back into the big picture as we started with in this episode, looking at spycraft across history. For Philby, I mean, you noted that he's similar in temperament to a Richard Sorge or a Dusko Popov type uh, operating on charisma and his wiles, also a little bit of sociopathy as well, which made him uh, successful. But where do you think Philby's story fits in the larger story of spycraft and espionage across history? Do you think he is similar to other successful spies or he is unique in some way that makes him remarkable? Where do you think that he stacks up? I think he was fairly unusual. And this had to do, I think, with what I said earlier about the class situation in Britain was that he was able to do what he did because of how he was enabled by his school friends. And once you had been to school with somebody, you knew that they, they were completely trustworthy. And that is was unique for that time and that place in England. I had a, a, a general thought about CIA officials. And I think this would probably extend to both KGB officials and um, and the Brits, particularly the Brits. Angleton was dying. He told the reporter, you know, the CIA got tens of thousands of brave people killed. We played with lives as if we owned them. We gave false hope. We, I, so misjudged what happened. Fundamentally, the founding fathers of U.S. intelligence were liars. The only thing they had in common was a desire for absolute power. I did things that I regret, but I was part of it and loved being in it. Alan Dulles, Richard Holmes, Carmel Laffey, and Frank Wiesner were the grand masters. If you were in a room with them, you were in a room full of people that you had to believe would deservedly end up in hell. Angleton slowly sipped his tea and then said, I guess I will see them there soon. Wow. So he's uh, very sober-minded about the type of work that he did, if that is for better or not. Well, this is a very interesting story, and there's a lot more to uncover. And I love these stories of espionage. And as we discussed earlier with the opening of archives, we're finding incredible stories like these. So for listeners who want to learn more, the name of your book is Spies and Traitors, Kim Philby, James Angleton, and the friendship and betrayal that would shape MI6, the CIA, and the Cold War. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you. That's all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes with sources, maps, links, anything else related to this episode, and all my other ones as well, go to parthenonpodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network this show is a part of, along with James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other great history shows as well. 
If you'd like to support the show, the two easiest ways to do so are to subscribe to it on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second thing is to join the membership program for History Unplugged. If you do so, you'll get completely ad-free episodes for the entire back catalog, which is about 600 episodes and growing. And all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash unplugged. 